Good evening and welcome to the July Regional Trade Association webinar. Uh, so this is the first time that we've brought the Trade Association Regional Meetings into a webinar format. Um, so I hope um, it will be of interest and of use to you guys. Um, so I'm Charlotte Lee, um, I'm Head of External Affairs at Make It, uh, which means I'm in charge of running the campaigns for the Trade Association. And tonight I'm Kirsty Johnson from Surge Protection Devices and also Paul, um, Paul Markham, our senior uh, training lecturer from NAPIC. And, um, and Kirsty will be providing an overview of lightning and surge protection for us. Um, there'll be time for questions at the end of Kirsty's presentation. Um, so if you could please use the um, ask a question function, which is in the control panel, which should be on the right hand side of your screen as you look at it. And if you type the questions in there, we'll do our best to get through as many as possible at the end of Kirsty's presentation. Um, but she also um, has, has put her contact details there uh, for you to be able to email her after if that would be of interest. Um, and after the technical presentation, um, I'll just be going through a short campaigns update to let you know what the Trade Association is doing on your behalf, and also to give you a bit more information about the NAPA Expo on the road events, which are happening later this year and um, are in 10 different locations across the country. So I hope there's one close to you, or some of you at least. Um, you'll find a full copy of this presentation in the handout section, which is again in the right-hand um, control panel. Um, and we'll give you some time at the end of the session uh, to be able to open it and save it if you like, um, but feel free to do that during the presentation as well. Um, and finally, there will be a short survey at the end of the webinar, um, so if you're able to spend a couple of minutes filling that in to let us know how we got on and whether you found this useful, it'd be really great to know um, whether or not we should continue to do these going forward. So uh, I'll now hand you over to Kirsty, and just to warn you, there will be a couple of polls throughout the presentation, uh, so be prepared for some audience interaction. Thank you. Thanks for that, Charlotte. As she said, I'm Kirsty from Surge Protection Devices, and I'm going to be talking you through the basics of lightning and surge protection. You'll see some of these slides I'm going to skip through because it's not important to you information about our company or about our manufacturer. I'd much rather you go away with the basics in surge and lightning protection. I'm going to turn off my camera because you don't need to see me. Um, I'll just... Paul me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, yeah, I'm Paul Markham. I'm the Senior Training Lecturer here at Mansfield. And I'll just hand you back to Kirsty. Okay, so I'll get on with the presentation. <laughs> Okay, as I said, we're from Surge Protection Devices. The company has, been, has got over 50 years experience in surge and lightning protection. That's pretty much the most important thing for you to take away about the company. The other thing is, we're a small family company. There are three members of staff, so each of us are completely technically trained to be able to answer any of your questions. So if you call our office, you will always get a technical answer. We're also available to be able to come out on site visits if there's something you're unsure of and you want us to come and look at. We use a manufacturer called Hackle, which are based in the Czech Republic. They're one of the leading specialists in surge and lightning protection. And they do a lot of things, as you can see in the list there, EMI filters, things like that. Again, I'm not going to go too much into it because it's not relevant to surge protection. OK. I don't know about you guys, but when I first started looking into surge and lightning protection, I always thought, oh, lightning's not something we have to worry about in the UK. We don't really get much of it. But over this one weekend in 2014, the UK was stuck, struck 100,000 times in just over 72 hours. That is a lot of lightning. I'm sure you've all seen lightning damage before. Um, as you can see, it's totally devastating. The thing I will say is when I'm talking about lightning protection, I'm talking about the internal stuff. So if you have external lighting, which is hit by lightning, there is nothing we can do to protect that light. That light is going to be toast. But what we do is stop the, light, the lightning current and the voltage then traveling around and blowing up the electrical equipment. So around the earth, there are up to 50 flashes of lightning every second. So it is an important thing that we need to be talking about. OK, this is just talking about the damage to electrical equipment. As you're all aware, Electrical equipment can be damaged in a lot of ways. 
we found through surveys and looking at damaged electrical equipment, a 34% of that is due to over voltages and lightning. So over voltages is when we're talking about surge. Okay. So what is a surge? Everyone can see lightning, lightning and it's easy enough to explain because it comes from the sky. Surges, not so much. Surges can be caused by switching events, they can be caused by nearby lightning strikes because lightning can travel miles and miles underground and then create a surge in a nearby property. Power cuts, obviously you know when you turn your power back on you can have a voltage surge. So what this is, is in your normal wave, all it is, as in illustrated here in the picture, is just a spike off that. It's very short, sharp, gone. What this does is to start to degrade your electrical equipment. So as everything's getting a lot smaller, it's becoming a lot more sensitive. So any damage to that, it's going to kill the device. Unlike lightning, where it'll blow things up, what this does is just degrade them. So instead of something lasting two years, it'll last six months. This is an increasing problem, as I said about the micro components, not just that, the also linking of electrical systems we're looking at now. Obviously offices, you've all got your computers linked together, so if a surge is on one system, it can travel down the cable to the next system, to the next system, and it can create a lot of damage. And everything's being joined up these days, and we're using electronics more and more in our day-to-day -day lives. I mean, you've only got to look at the new things available for domestic properties now with smart properties, LEDs, things like that. You are using a lot more electronic equipment than we were, say, five years ago. Okay, so this is the basic principle of surge protection. So you've got your surge coming in, which is your red squiggle. Um, your yellow box is your SPD, it's your surge protection device. So all it does is it's normally open, so your electrical current is just throwing, flowing through to your equipment, no problem. But what it does, this device, when it detects anything above 275 volts, it closes that switch, sends the excess to air, and resets itself, letting your normal flow go. This does this so quick, it does it in 25 nanoseconds, so nothing will see the surge, nothing will see any break in your supply, your equipment will carry on working, your RCDs won't even trip. It does it that quick. And again, with these devices, they're not a one-hit wonder, they will keep taking devices, we give, keep, keep taking surges, we give them about 100,000 hours lifespan. This is the regulations, I'm not really going to go into them, but if you do want to talk further about the regulations, if you just send me an email or speak to NAPIT Direct, we can answer your questions as well. If you put the question in the question box and we see it, we'll be able to help you with that. Okay, anyone that knows anything about surge protection knows that there is three types. You have type one, type two, and type three. Your type one is your protection against direct lightning currents. So that is to go at the main, main incoming panel of buildings that need lightning protection. You have type 2, which is surge protection. So this is to do anything, which is like your indirect lightning or switching events, things like that, and properties that don't need lightning protection. And then you have type 3 protection. So this is protecting a specific piece of machinery or a specific socket. We do these for fire alarm panels, things like that. I believe now we have a poll question. We do indeed, thank you Kirsty. So I'll just launch this poll now. So um, the question is, a type 2 um, surge protection device fitted at sub-distribution board offers protection against what? Indirect lightning effects, overcurrent or a direct lightning strike? So um, we're getting some answers in which is great. Um, we'll wait for a few more people. Great, a couple of people still voting. Great, fab. I'll close that poll now. Okay, so the answer for that was indirect lightning strikes. Overcurrent is what you look at with your RCDs, things like that. Surge devices do not deal with current. The only time we ever deal with current is in a lightning strike because current follows your lightning. 
when we're talking about surge protection, it's only ever voltage we're talking about. So I'll carry on. Okay, this is to explain your lightning distribution. The reason I've put this slide in is because I'm going to now talk to you about light, lightning protection. So there's two instances where you have to install lightning protection. This is mandatory, and although people don't like me using that word, you actually do need to fit it or at least suggest it to be fitted. These are if the building has external lightning protection, so the copper tape um, and the spikes on top of the building, your earth rods, things like that, or if you have, it's fed by overhead lines. They are the two instances where you have to have surge protection or lightning protection fitted. Um, I'm going to talk you through now why with this diagram. As you can see from the top, this is your lightning. We're, we're talking about an external lightning protection on this diagram, just to save any confusion. Um, the maximum strike you can have lightning-wise is 200 kA. So if it's hit the, the um, external lightning protection, it comes down the building. Where it hits the earth, it will be cross-bonded to your incoming panel. So, as we know, electricity takes the fastest route. 50% of that will go to earth, and 50% of it is going to come across the cross bond into your incoming panel. So if you have no lightning protection there, you can have up to 100 kA on your electrical appliances. So it's going to be completely irrelevant to whether you've got the external lightning protection fitted, because it's going to blow up every piece of electrical equipment in your house or building or whatever it is. I always say house because it's what's on the diagram. This diagram I use, I don't really go into the 10350 and 820 um, because to be honest it's a bit complicated and it's not really needed for general installations. If you do want to know more about it, if you send me a question I can help with that. What I use this diagram for mainly is to show you the difference. Okay, so your green is a lightning strike and your red is a surge. So as you can see with your surge in your red, it's there and then it's gone. It's a quick spike and it's gone as quick as it appears. With lightning, it's a very large spike and it takes a long time for it to dissipate. So this is why we look at stronger protection for lightning than we do for surge. Okay, and so your type one lightning protection. There are two types. I know the thing at the top, my box at the top says three. You've got your 100k, 70k and 50ka. But nobody stocks a 75ka. We don't bother. If you need protection that high, you put 100ka on it. If you need a lower one, you put 50ka on. The reason you've got the difference is if you're putting it on a building that's got overhead lines, so it's just a domestic property, you do not need 100ka protection. This is usually put in a risk assessment, but if you're unsure or you haven't got a risk assessment that somebody said what you need, if you give us a call at the office, we'll be able to help you with that anyway. As I said before, type 1 protection is the bit that's mandatory. So if you've got external lighting protection or overhead lines, this has to be fitted as close to the main incomer as possible. But type 1 devices alone do not protect electronics. The way I like to think about this is like a funnel system. So it's larger at the top than it is at the bottom. So if you have your type 1 protection at the top, that cuts off a bit and makes it a bit smaller for it to be able to handle. Your type 2 protection cuts it a bit smaller for it to be able to handle and then your type 3 makes it small enough for your electronic devices to be able to take. So it's just like stage protection. Type 2, so this is your surge protection. So you use this on a building if you don't need any lightning protection. So it's got no, no external lightning, it's got no, no overhead lines, you can use just type 2. It's no problem. You also use this if you have a main panel with lightning protection on, if you have then have any subboards more than 10 meters away, you put type 2 protection on it. The reason for that is because 80% of surges actually occur inside the installation. Only 20% come from your mains, although whenever I see a surge at a house I always blame my mains. It's not. It's to do with switching events and things like that that we discussed earlier. That's what creates surges in your system. That is what's going to damage your product. So basically what we don't want is for you to have your mains incomer, subboards around, a, a surge to happen the furthest distance it can away from your main panel and then blow up all your electronic equipment on the way back before we take it out. So this is why we say within a 10 meter 
radius we put additional protection on. Okay. And then we have type 3, which is your equipment protection. These are used to protect individual sockets. Um, I had a company, I dealt with a big hotel chain that just wanted to protect the TV. So what they did was put a tiny little device hidden behind the socket and it protected one socket. Um, you can use them to protect PLCs, computer systems, things like that. It's the bit at the end of the funnel that gives you the tiniest bit of light let through voltage for your equipment. So this would only let through sort of your 275 volts for your system. And we have another question. We do indeed, Kirsty. So question two is, what type of surge protection is required for a building with external light, lightning protection or overhead lines? So type one, type two, or type three? Got a good range voting. A few more minutes, we're nearly at 100%. A few more seconds, should I say. Great, fab. We'll close that down now. Okay, so this question was about buildings that have external lightning protection and overhead lines. So in this case, it's type 1 that's mandatory. Your type 2 is the thing that you put on your sub panels or goes on buildings that don't need lightning protection. So your buildings that haven't got overhead lines or external protection. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about combined surge arresters. I'm going to skip through this bit and I'm going to go to the next page because all it is is an extra step in it. The reason we say it's a combined arrestor is because the devices that I was just talking about, so you've got your type 1, type 2 and type 3, you don't, you don't want to have try and put three of them in one board, do you? You've not got enough space to try and have your big let through all the way down to your little let through, which is what you need to make your electronics safe. So what we do is to compress it into one device. So as you can see on the diagram here, so you've got your lightning current coming in, you reds your lightning protection, and once the, the big chunk's gone and sent that down to earth, it goes through to your green, which is your surge protection. And once that chunk's gone, it sends it down through to your type 3 and your blue. So all that's doing is giving that funnel effect, but it's doing it in 25 nanoseconds. So as slow as it takes me to describe what I mean to you, it does it in much, much quicker. And then that lets through enough voltage for even sensitive equipment, such as energy meters, PLCs, things like that, to be plugged in directly the other side and to have no interference at all. As I said, this is done to simplify installation. You don't want to try and put three devices in. And it means then you just have to buy one rather than buying three. This is just to going through the advanced of... Um, the advantages of enhanced surge protection, which is what I've just talked through with you. So I'm just going to skip through this slide because it's not really relevant. Okay, this is one of them that I'll explain to you because it's worth you knowing. But when you come to buy surge protection, it's not really something you need to worry about. Okay, so surges can exist between two pairs of conductors. So between your lives or you, obviously you do not want your surges there. And then you have your surges from your from your lives taking it to earth from your main life so usually with surge protection you have the common mode protection so the bit that's in the green so when you think about surge protection it is protection between your live and your earth so that's what it's doing it's tapping off from your live to your earth or your neutral to your earth differential mode protection is giving you protection between the phases so what we say when we say full mode protection, what it's doing is combining them two and it's giving you protection between the phases and between your earth, between your lives and your earth. So it's really as simple as that. The only time this is ever talked about is if it's for lightning protection and sometimes then it will be a spec on a system. As I said, you really don't need to worry about it. You can give us a call if you're unsure or speak to your wholesaler, whoever it is you buy through and they'll be able to ask the question for you. That's not a problem. 
as I said, when it comes to normal surge protection, it's not something you need to worry about. Okay. Coordination of protection. So, this is a little bit what I was saying about when you put them around the building. So if you have type one at your main panel, and then you have type two on your subboards, so it's coordinate and make sure that surge protection works together. If you don't coordinate them, and as I said, you just put something on your mains, this can cause them for surges to be generated around the building and then to blow up your equipment and cause damage to your equipment en route back to your mains. It's also important to consider the different brands of surge protection devices you use. This is purely for the fact that they can use different technology, which means they can work in slightly different ways, so you're best using the same brand throughout. Technically, on a, an installation level, generally you'd be installing surge protection for the first time, because there's not many places that actually have it, so it's not really an issue. Um, it's one of them things that comes up with like manufacturers, you know, like Hager don't like you put in MK in their boards, it's that sort of thing because it's due to the technology, it's not just a brand war. Okay, so this is just a diagram of talking about the coordinated protection. So, on your incoming supply, as is indicated in the first box, on your main distribution board, you've got a surge protection device coming from your MCB. It's worth saying now, if you put a surge protection device off one of your fuses, or your MCVs, it then covers that entire board. I will go into installation a little bit later on, but it's worth just mentioning that bit now. So, if that was all you had, say it's a domestic property or whatever, just one board, then that would be enough to protect your entire board. It's no problem at all. If then you've got a sub-distribution board, so another panel further around, you'd put another device at that panel. So this is what we were talking about. Over 10 meters, you'd put another device in. So if this then, within a 10 meter radius, had like a computer room or things, things like that, then that's completely protected, you do not need to worry about it. Again, that whole board is protected from that surge device. But then, if your equipment you want to protect, say it's a big installation and you've got a specific piece of machinery, say on a shop floor, things like that you want to protect, then it's more than 10 meters away from that sub-panel, you then put another protection device at that machinery. So whether it's in the socket or the final PowerPoint, things like that. So the next one, all I've done is put a specific device there, just so I can show you the downstream of the coordination. So the device I've put in the first box is, I'm not going to go into the part numbers because it's not really relevant, but it's a type 1, 2 and 3, 3 phase and neutral, enhanced surge protection, so it's your 1, 2 and 3. It's 100 kA protection, so this is your top range of your lightning protection. So that's your main board completely protected. Anything within a 10 meter radius of that main board is absolutely safe. Then on your sub board, you have a device which is just your type two and three. And this again is your three phase and neutral. So anything within 10 meter radius of that is then protected. At your final point, we have a type two and three device, which can be put on an individual machine, as I said before and that is that machine protected specifically. Okay. Um, right, I'm going to put my video on, which is not something I really like doing. But it's just because I have the device here, so I can show you. Let me just move that out of the way so I can see my slide. Can I just... I'm sorry, technical difficulty. There we go, I found the button. Right, so this is the surge device you're looking at. This is your type 1, 2 and 3 surge device. This is your lightning protection level 1, so all that means is it's 100 kA protection. It's got a very, through let, low, very low let through voltage. It's got the full mode protection that we were talking about before, so it's not only got your protection to earth, it's got your protection between your phases. As I said before, it's coordinated, so you've got your type 1, 2 and 3. You've got your indication on the front, so when this is wired in, these LEDs will be lit to tell you it's working. You also have, on the bottom, remote indication. This is a 12 volt supply which you can wire to an LED or a buzzer if it's hidden away in a panel, so you can see that it's working. 
but then let you know when it's not. Again, it's a 100,000 hour lifespan, so we're not anticipating it falling out anytime soon, but if it takes a large strike, obviously you need to check your device. There's no earth leakage, which means it's not going to cause any of your RCDs to trip. And it's manufactured by Hackle, as I said, the company in Czech Republic. These can also, I'm going to put that down because it's really heavy. Um, these can also come in enclosures. Um, so you can use either plastic or metal enclosures for that. And as you can see, I'll pick it back up again, it is an eight module width, so it's a big device. Um, you're looking at two modules per pole of your device, then plus your neutral. Okay, we have a poll question. We do indeed, Kirsty. So um, have a good look at the picture and um, remember what the image um, or that the device looked like as you was holding it because this question relates to the image and unfortunately we couldn't put the image on the poll slide. So um, hopefully you've had a look um, and I'll now launch the poll. So um, based on that image, uh, what type of protection is provided by that um, SPD that Kirsty just showed you? Was it type 2 and 3, type 3, or type 1, 2, and 3? So, um, getting lots of votes now, which is great. Nice and quick this time. Just wait a couple more seconds. Great. Oh, just had another few. Fab. I'll close that down. Okay, that's fab. 96% of you said the right one. It's a type 1, 2, and 3 combined arrestor. So whenever we're talking about lightning, we're talking about type 1. So it's even though it's the smallest number, it's actually the biggest protection. We have to do things backwards, of course. Okay, I'm going to put my camera back on so you can see my... Um... Right, so now we're talking about type 2, 3 protection. So we're talking about this device. So this, again, I've gone with your three phase. This is your SY2C40X LED. It's one of our most common products that we use because you can put this on any installation that's three phase, or we do the single phase version. That you, haven't, you don't need ex lightning protection, so it's got no external lightning protection. It's got no overhead lines. So this is just a full module width. It's got the remote contact again, and it's got LEDs on the front, so when it's wired in, they'll be on. Again, it's got no earth leakage in it. It'll work at anything over 275 volts. It'll start, send it to earth, and reset. As I said before, it does it in 25 nanoseconds, so you haven't got to worry about anything tripping out. Again, it can be put in an enclosure, and that's not a problem. All our devices, sorry, it is worth mentioning, everything is DIN rail mountable, so it'll just slip onto your DIN rail. So as I said, this is device is to go on anything that doesn't have external lighting protection or overhead lines. So this is our generally our commercial device. And last but not least, this one isn't going to hurt the hand holding it. This is our domestic surge arrestor. So this is a single module width. We've compressed it from two modules down to a single. It still contains your neutral and your live. Purely so, it's easier to fit in your consumer unit. This specific device has no earth leakage, meaning you can put it anywhere in your consumer unit in a spare way. Wire it from your ring main or from its own breaker and into your live, your neutral to your neutral bar and your earth to your earth bar. Again, I'll go through installation later, so don't worry about remembering that now. It's got a very low let through voltage. It's DIN rail mountable, as I said. You can't put it on your buzz bar, so you need to make sure you shift, you shift your buzz bar along, and um, that's pretty much it for that device. That is our biggest selling device. I know a lot of um, electrical people don't really consider domestic devices um, as important, that you don't need them on a domestic installation. But I find that um, more domestic people are asking about it, especially as there are more technical things fitted. As I said earlier, things with your smart homes, your LEDs, uh, expensive media equipment, computers, bigger TVs, games consoles, even things like plugging your mobile phone in overnight. If you're having surges, then all your devices are seeing them, so it's degrading everything prematurely. That device sits at about £70 trade list, 
So it's not really expensive when you're considering the fact it's going to give you 10 years protection for all of your electronic goods. So we're finding more and more domestic householders are asking about them. I'm getting many calls in the office now, people asking for any sort of protection. I then get asked about them trading leads. Everybody knows about the trading leads that you can buy. Well, for one, they're not really regulated surge protection at all. Two, you are never going to fit everything in your house into one. So by the time you buy them all and fit them around your house, when you're never ever going to put one behind your washing machine, I, sh I should hope, um, you're going to have reached a cost way above what it will protect to put one of these in your board and protect every outgoing circuit. So it, it also doesn't matter if you've got a split phase board and um, where you've got your two, your two sections. All you have to do is put this in in one spare way and it will protect the entire board. This is because you've only got one incoming live and one incoming neutral. So because it's connected across them cables, it's done in parallel. So it just essentially works like a pressure release valve for any over voltage, meaning you don't need one on either side. Okay, the other important thing to mention to you is, as we said before, anything with overhead lines, which generally TT systems are overhead lines, you have to tell whoever you're buying the surge device off. If you're buying it through a wholesaler, make sure you tell them it's a TT system. The reason why, I'm going to go through it now. The device will look exactly the same. So where you see that blue dotted box, that is essentially inside the device. So what I'm talking about now is the technical goings on inside. The installation will still be exactly the same and you'll view the device exactly the same. So. On a standard system, so your TNS or your TNCS, as you can see, the surge divide, the surge little bit of SPD inside the box sits um, after you live and before they connect together. So you can see then they all connect together and then they all go down to earth, which is no problem at all. So you three lives and then you're neutral. Again, we're talking about a three phase system, obviously. But this principle applies to if you're using a single phase. And then if you have a TT system on the other side, the difference is you've got your three lives, which are exactly the same, all coming together. But then you'll notice the, the, the SPD on the neutral is sitting below the join, not above it. The reason for this is so, as we all know, the impedance can change on a, on a TT system, depending on the weather, depending on a variety of things. So what we do is put in this sort of fail safe to ensure that there's a separation gap between your neutral and your earth. Meaning, if a surge comes down your lives and it goes through your surge device and it isn't going down to earth quick enough, it'll allow it to come back to neutral. Um, and we're talking about milliseconds here, like nanoseconds. So we're talking about a very short amount of time for it to then filter back down through your SPD. The reason we do that is just to give, give the lower, the high impedance a chance to get the voltage away. Generally, on a domestic property, it's not really a problem, but it's worth having the device fit the specific place. Um, I was explaining earlier that you can use a TT device on a normal TNS installation, and but really for a TT system, you need to be using a specific TT device, so it's worth mentioning. If you've got a pen and a piece of paper, the, worth, the thing's worth writing down, if you're going to ask surge protection, if you're going to a wholesaler and you say, right, I need surge protection, the three questions he should ask you, or the three things you should be able to tell him are, is it single phase or three phase? Do you need lightning or surge protection? So is it fed by overhead lines or is it got external lightning protection? Or none of it, you need surge protection. And then, what sort of earthing supplies it got? Is it your standard earthing or is it an earth bar? Yeah, your earthing rod. So whether it's a TT or a TNS system. If you tell him it's a TT system, that's no problem. The, the prices of the device are exactly the same. It's just the inner workings of it that is a specific device. And again, as I said before, if you do have any questions, just let us know and I can answer them for you at the end. Or you can send me an email if you'd prefer. Right, I'm going to talk about wiring. This is the diagram from the regs, and it's awful. 
So I'm going to put my camera back on. I'm going to talk you through using the device so it's easier for you. Okay. Put it the right way up. Okay, so this is your device. So as I said, you sit it in a spare way in your consumer unit. So it just clips on the DIN rail. You take your live from the ring main breaker or from an, its own breaker, depending on which way you want to do it. You can do it off the ring main because you can use it as its spur. So that goes into your live at the top. Your neutral, you take off your neutral bar um, from whatever side of the box it's sitting on, whatever side of the consumer unit it's sitting on, and then your earth to your earth bar. That is literally it for your installation. I won't make it any more complicated than that. That is it. Your device is in. The light will come on. It's working. Done. The amount of calls I get saying, I've took my main tails out. What do I do now? It's put your tails back and call me back. <laughs> People try to really make this a lot more complicated than it needs to be. It's only sitting in parallel, so you haven't got to worry about any power going through it. So all it's doing, I'll just go quickly through you again. Your live's coming in. Any surges are going down to earth. So anything above 275 volts gets sent to Earth and it resets and your power carry, carries on going. I'm just going to turn my camera off now. Okay. And quickly, I'm just going to tell you about status indication. This is just something, it's worth you knowing. Um, don't worry, there's no questions on this bit. It's just, if you buy a surge protection device, you want to make sure that they have status indication on them. So what I mean by that is they have to have an LED on the front or a window indication or a push button indication or a buzzer. There has to be something to tell you it's working. Basically to come up to standard. If it's got no indication, which some of them on the market don't, it does not meet your wiring regulations. So even though you're putting it in and you're putting surge protection in, it's not meeting your regulations so you may as well not be installing it. Okay, I think we're going to go to questions. If any of you, there, there's my contact details on there. So if you want to take a note of, that's my email address, and you've got both my mobile number there and the office number. As I said, with there only being the three of us, no matter who you speak to in the office, somebody will be able to answer your question all the time. You'll never be passed from pillar to post. Um, so that's that. Uh, a couple of things that I'm just going to mention now while you're thinking about questions is we do the complete range of surge protection so anything from your mains as you've seen to your domestics then down to things like your PV protection for your DC side before your inverter protections for CCTV systems and satellite systems things like that and um, the CCTV arrestors are quite common because if you have CCTV on the external of a building you've got say you've got 12 cameras put up they all come back to the box if lightning has struck one of them cameras, it's going to travel back down the lead to the box. And if you've got no protection there at all, it's going to blow the box up and go out and blow up each of them cameras as well. Whereas if you've got them protection, which we sell to go between the, between the camera and the box, it's a little clip in arrester. What it does then is stop the device, stop the surge there, stop the lightning there. So it stops it in the box and then all your rest of your cameras are saved. As I said at the beginning, whatever the lightning hits is gone. There is nothing we can do about it, apart from say, please don't hit it. There is literally nothing we can do. So what we're trying to do is protect anything further on from that and save any damage. Um, and then your PV. Your PV, it's worth putting surge protection on because you're putting it on the roof. It's, it's really that simple. Your inverter is a lot of money's worth of kit. If you're working with PV, it's worth installing it on your DC side. And lastly but not leastly, if you are installing LEDs, Surge protection is something you're worth talking about with your customer. This is because LEDs are so sensitive, the slightest thing can set them off, and they're a lot of money to replace. They're not like our old screwing light bulbs. Um, I think that's it for me. If, if you have any questions. They certainly do, um, Kirsty and Paul. So um, I'll start off with the first one we've received, um, which is from Phil, um, who says, what type of certificate would I issue after installing a domestic surge protection device? So I don't know if you're willing to put your camera back on so they can see who's, who's talking. Well, if it's, we got voice, it's me that's talking. <laughs> so I'm hoping my voice isn't that shrill. Anyway, yeah, um, certification, the main thing is that you, you fill out a certificate, uh, either or 
of a EIC or a minor weight certificate would do it. You are you are altering the system in, in, in a slight way. You're not changing many characteristics, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, at the very least, the minor works or an EIC with the circuit details on it, even though they may be short. And that's the answer from me. Okay, thank you very much. So we've got another one um, from Chris who's asking, uh, when do type 1 um, surge protection devices become mandatory for overhead line fed, for overhead line fed buildings? Okay, in the regulations, it's very, very complicated about this fact. Basically, you can do a risk assessment, which includes you getting up and measuring the distance between the the end of the, basically the distance of the cable coming into the house, and you have to do, there's a very long calculation, which you will find in your regs book. You also then be able to prove, if you're not putting it on, it's, it's basically a risk assessment. So you've got this calculation, then you have to prove that the incomer into the building can take a 6 kV lightning strike. Um, so overall, you are worth recommending it. Always recommend it. You can't force a customer to have it, as with everything we'll talk about, but it's recommend it just to cover your own back. Put it on your quote, and then you can sign to say you, you've, you've recommended it. If you complete that risk assessment and you say they don't need it, and then they come back, had a lightning strike, and said, actually, I do need it, that comes back on you. Um, so what I always recommend is just to suggest it. Great, thank you, Kirsty. Uh, so we've got one from uh, Stephen um, who has asking: uh, Are there any tests to perform after the installation to check that they're working? That's come from a few a few of the members. No, um, no, there's no test. Once the device is in, the LEDs come on or windows on, whatever. That device is working. The device is active. Um, when you do do any testing, though, it's worth mentioning now because you brought up testing. Obviously, you have to disconnect the device. Unless it's one of the ones, some of our devices, if they haven't got LEDs on the front and have a window, some of them um, have plug out cartridges, at which point, if you're testing, you can just take out the cartridges. Um, there is specific regulations, I believe, NAPIT have, if you have the surge protection device in and you can't take it out, you don't want to do the wires, um, you can do things with lowering your, your tester. Um, do you have anything to add on? Um, you know only that you can join line and neutral together to test things. Make sure that you use a lower test voltage, 250 volts. Uh, best thing to do is to disconnect it uh, and make sure that whatever certificate that you you issue in the vulnerable testing box, you put down that there is a surge protective device fitted for future people to take note of. That's it. And if you're there doing any testing, Ensure you've checked there's no surge device, and then also ask them if it's a domestic house if they have any of them surge training leads. Otherwise, it is going to put your test out. Thank you. We've got one from Andrew here. Uh, can the SPPD go in a new consumer unit adjacent to the existing consumer unit connected through the meter tails via a Henley joint block? Good question. Uh, yes, but there is no. You've got no overcurrent protection on that on that device then, so no really, no it shouldn't come straight from the, the Henley block, shouldn't come straight from the tails, you will need some type of overcurrent protective device uh, to protect it. Uh, as Kirsty said, with a, with a single phase one in a domestic consumer unit, you could connect it as the spare, uh, one of your spares, or I should say non-fuse spares, uh, ring, so just straight out of your terminals as a non-fuse spare from the 32 amp. 60898 circuit breaker uh, and if you're on a three phase system then you would need a three phase module to to feed the to feed the surge protective device enclosure so it's worth saying now each of the devices have a different um, have a different backup fuse recommended In your domestic one you're looking at a 16 to a 32 amp and then you're going up to your bigger devices you're looking at a 63 amp or 100 so Depends what device you're installing. All of them will come instructions, but if you're ever unsure, just give us a call and we'd be able to tell you what backup fuse you needed anyway, if that's something you need to talk through. Great, and then the final question is, do I need to put any labels on the um, distribution board, on the DB? Chapter 51 doesn't mention any labels about SPIRT, Surge protective devices. Uh, at the end of the day, 
you as the installation in engineer should really take as many precautions as you can to let the person following you up or even yourself in future, because I forget lots of things, uh, that a safe protective device is installed. Uh, if it's labelled up, uh, it makes the job easier. If it's on previous paperwork in vulnerable equipment boxes, it makes the job easier uh, and you're not damaging when you're doing insulation resistance testing. It's something worth mentioning there as well. If you have, when I was talking about a larger installation, so you have your main protection, then you've got subboards. If you've got your main protection in, as Paul was saying, it is worth putting some sort of note or something to say the surge protection because then the person will have a look around the building rather than thinking, oh, I can just take the wires out of that one and it's done. And um, you need to let them know that there is further surge protection around the building. Great, thank you very much, um, Kirsty and Paul. Um, as Kirsty said, if you've got any further questions, um, then her details are on the screen, so um, please uh, let her know um, in the future. And I just wanted to cover up a quick question, which was, um, I missed the first 20 minutes, is it recorded, and if so, where from? This webinar is recorded, um, it has been recorded, and a copy will be going up onto the, uh, the NAPIT YouTube channel after after today, so um, for anyone who missed it or wants to watch things again, can. So uh, we're now going to move on to um, to uh, my section of the presentation. So this is the campaigns updates. Um, so hopefully um, everyone will stay with me. It's a brief one. Um, so I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes really bringing you up to date with the trade association key campaigns, and this is what we tend to do at the regional meetings themselves. We have an external presentation on a technical subject and then we just let you know what we're doing so um, to make sure you keep us on our feet really. So one of the biggest um, campaign topics that we've been working on now for a few years is, is how to improve electrical safety in the private rented sector. So you'll see on the screen now um, there is a, an infographic um, which is available to download from the trade association pages of the website. And that infographic outlines what the issue is, what our members think about it, and what we want to change in order to make it better. Um, so uh, please go and have a look if you like. Um, and we've got some um, we've got some recent progress made in this area. So um, within the recent um, Housing and Planning Act, which received royal assent on uh, the 12th of May. I'd like to add, before all of the um, uh, uh, hype around Brexit and the new Prime Minister and all sorts, so this was pre the, um, the interest in political situation we're experiencing at the moment, but the, it, the, the bill did reach um, royal assent and it became an act. And what it does is it gives the government the powers to introduce specific requirements um, to introduce electrical safety standards within the private sector through secondary legislation if they choose to um, at a later date. And what they've effectively done, the government, is buy themselves a bit more time um, to understand the cost implications of introducing <coughs> electrical safety standards in the private rented sector, hear from industry, <coughs> but also by giving um, them the powers to introduce secondary legislation, it means that the process will be a lot quicker um, for them to introduce, but also it will be a lot easier for them to amend if they want to at a later stage. So um, that's what they've done. As you'll see from the wording on the slide, it was clause 122. And what they've done is they've said they may introduce regulations um, in relation to the installation of uh, in the premises for the supply of electricity and or electrical fixtures, fittings and appliances. So they're looking at both the, um, the electrical installation and the appliances. So what we're doing um, is uh, we're working on a, a document which outlines how, how NAPIT, how our members, how we think the clause should be implemented um, to give to the government as a sort of start of the 10. Uh, we understand that they're currently informally consulting with industry on how they could be introduced and importantly they're conducting a cost benefit analysis so this is what they um, this is what turns into the impact assessment which all uh, the government has to do for any new policy they introduce to make sure that it is going to be um, more beneficial than it is costly and that's especially important with the conservative government who we all know is very anti-regulation um, but our position has been and remains that we, we think that an electrical check should be carried out in the form of an electrical installation condition report um, every five years or at least every five years and that should be carried out by a competent registered installer um, with experience and knowledge in electrical inspection and testing. 
Um, so that's to limit it down to those registered with competent person schemes like yourselves, but also those that have undertaken the, um, the appropriate inspection and testing uh, qualification and training. Um, so that we make sure that um, those who can do it properly do. Um, and what we said is this should be supported by an annual visual check. Um, and we said this can be carried out by the landlord or responsible person to, to ensure ongoing safety between the formal inspections. And the reason why we haven't linked this annual inspection um, visual check to um, the uh, to, to registered competent people is is about cost. And the minute that we start adding extra costs to what we're, we're suggesting and requiring, um, the minute that the government are going to turn off and say no, and, and the industry sort of, and by the industry I mean the landlords, the trade associations re that represent them, sort of put their hands up and say you're adding too much cost and it's ridiculous. So what we're hoping is to go for the five years to start with, supported by the annual check to make sure that somebody's looking at it and that they have information and guidance around what they need to look out for, and that hopefully should then lead them to calling uh, you know, somebody registered and competent to carry out the work if needed. But it, it's a good place to start with the five years. Um, and this is just in England. This um, Housing and Planning Act only applies to England at the moment. Obviously Scotland, they do have a requirement to have the ICRs carried out every five years. And in Wales, it's in their code of practice, which all landlords must abide by, but it's just a recommendation, so it's not a requirement in Wales yet either. So Scotland leads the way in this area. So um, another area that we're focusing on at the moment is um, increasing awareness of uh, electrical safety and, and what to do when carrying out electrical work in your home in terms of building regulation compliance, in terms of what certificates to um, expect, and in terms of what work is notified. And we're doing that through um, through the creation of this poster that you'll see on your screen now. And the, the, the intention is to distribute this to wholesale stores. So, we're aware that our members um, raise concerns about the the sale of or the unrestricted sale of electrical goods in DIY and wholesale stores, um, and you know, and are concerned by the dangerous advice which is given when they are being sold, which often leads to dangerous um, dangerous installations. So. We've seen previous attempts to try and improve awareness of Part P of the building regulations through the um, Communities and Local Government Select Committee a couple of years ago, and they worked with the British Retail Consortium, who's a trade association which re represents wholesale stores, um, to try to um, make it mandatory, well, to, to introduce some labelling on, on electrical good packaging. And they came up with this agreed set text that they were going to use about using registered people and making sure that um, notifiable work is, is, is notified to building regulations and, and text that they were happy with. Um, but because it was a voluntary agreement, it wasn't implemented as well as um, expected. And the Select Committee actually funded some research to be carried out into how well um, the voluntary agreement was working. And, um, and what the research found was that 65% of customers received no guidance in store regarding either the law or the need to re use registered competent electricians. But also um, that the labelling uh, was being done by some of the companies that signed up to the voluntary agreement, but not all. And the reason behind this really is um, the reason why that didn't work was because the, 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 co the companies Turn, you know, basically turned the manufacturing companies said that you know unless this is a mandatory requirement, um, the, this is cost prohibitive, and, and not all of our um, competitors are doing it, so we're putting ourselves at a disadvantage. But not only that, it limited where they could sell their goods um, because the advice on the packaging was only related to England and, and the UK. As much as they tried to make it generic, it meant that when they wanted to sell the products to different countries, that they had to make sure that the wording was different or they used different wording. So it was really, um, it, you know, they basically said, I'm not doing it unless you force us to. And, you know, as I said, with the Conservative government, there is no way that they're going to force them to label goods um, or restrict the sale of goods, um, unfortunately, either, which we know would be the preferable solution. Um, but when you can still buy a gas boiler and fit it yourself at home, um, you know, there's, it's, it's going to be very difficult to try to restrict the sale of goods. So what we've done and the approach that we've taken um, focuses on increasing the education of those being asked um, 
questions about electrical installations in store and providing advice directly to the purchaser of the goods to raise awareness. Um, so this is through these posters and there'll be some leaflets, but also training of the staff who are giving the advice. And I don't mean training the staff so that they can advise somebody how to fit the plug socket or how to fit the new consumer unit, but it means training the staff so they know what work is notifiable, the different routes to, to how to notify building control of notifiable works, um, uh, what certificates customers should expect uh, once the work's been done, and the importance and benefits of using competent registered people and where to point people to to find people like yourselves. So, that's the sort of work stream that we're, go, we're, we're, um, we're working on at the moment. And the information I've just spoken to is on these slides, but I didn't want to, to read through it often for you. So you can, as I say, see them in the handout if, if you're interested uh, in, in, in more of those. So the final sort of campaign update I want to give just briefly is the work that we've been doing on service cutout fuse removal, which we know is a massive issue for you guys. So we had a fantastic response to a survey that we did on this last year. Um, this, is, this is the infographic, that the image on the screen, which relates to this issue, and it can be seen on the Trade Association pages of the website again under the campaign section. So take a look. It just illustrates what the issue is and what we're doing about it and what you say about it. But in terms of um, what we're doing at the moment, um, and we know that this has been a long-going, long-standing issue, but we're collaborating with um, a variety of industry stakeholders to help um, produce and support an industry paper which outlines some options um, for overcoming the issue that you guys have with service cutout fuse removal. Um, and allocating the, well, illustrating the costs and benefits of each one. Um, so almost doing a government impact assessment for them in, in, a, in a more low-key way. But we're working with um, a variety of industry stakeholders, so other competent person scheme operators and industry charities. But we've also got the attention and interest of the Energy Networks Association, who's the trade association which represents the um, distribution businesses, the DNOs, but also Energy UK, who represents the energy suppliers. Um, as well as GEMSERV, who manage the MACOPA agreement, which is what the meter operators um, comply with. So we feel like we've got all the right people around the table discussing this now. And the uh, proposal which is getting the most traction within this area is, um, is creating um, or allowing um, registered electrical, in, uh, people registered on a DCLG authorised competent person scheme to also register with the suppliers or distribution businesses and gain authorization to remove, replace, and temporary, temporarily reseal cutout fuses. So, excuse me. So we are um, working um, <coughs> with them to try to push that through, and we're looking at whether that can be built into the um, uh, electrotechnical assessment specification, or how best to, to, to sort of push this to the next stage. Um, so we will, of course, keep you updated, but I just wanted to sort of let you know that that is, um, that, that we are making progress in that area, uh, slowly but surely, we hope. So thank you for sticking with me. Just the latest one, just about the expos. I just wanted to let you know that the November round of regional trade association meetings, which we host three times a year, will this year be coincided with... Um, or, yeah, c collated with the NAPA Expo on the Road events. Um, and on the screen now, it shows the venues and the dates of these events um, and the locations. And what we've done is we've tried to keep them within a reasonable travel distance of the usual regional trade association meetings. But also, we've been very um, conscious to try to make it, make put them in positions where perhaps we haven't been before, or perhaps our members have asked for some more engagement from us in the past. So to try to give people um, more of an opportunity to attend, um, to attend where possible. So in terms of what will be discussed, so that there, there'll be afternoon evening events. So it will be four o'clock till eight o'clock. There'll be two sessions. Session one will be the um, all about installation and, and the workshops on the screen there. And then session two. Uh, will be um, about the, an IET 18th edition overview. You know, we've just had Amendment 3 to the 17th, but that's um, that's looking to be coming out in January 20, 2019 or 
or around then. Um, so sort of looking at what the, what they're going to put in there, um, and also to give you a heads up really, and also the um, inspection workshops where we'll be looking at EICRs, uh, certification and documentation, and thermal imaging. So if you want to um, register for one of these or to find out more about where they are and what's going to be happening at each of them, we've got our own website. Um, so it's www.naperexpo.co.uk. And if you log on to that, you'll be able to register um, and look at who the speakers are, the venues are, who else will be coming in terms of partners. Um, and if you register for that online, we're doing it through a um, a, something called Eventbrite, and they will send you a a summary, really, a summary of the um, a summary of your your registration. So uh, that should serve as a, a useful reminder, and it has all of the addresses and the information on. So that's um, that's all for me. Um, we've got time for a couple of quick questions to me, if you um, if anybody has any. Um, otherwise, um, it it'll be um, a thank you and goodbye from from me. So. Um, Okay, Charlotte, we have one question here for you um, from Jeff. Is this webinar going to be available on the forum afterwards? Thank you, Kirsty. So, um, so yes, this uh, this webinar will be available. Um, it will be available on the um, on the NAPIT YouTube channel, and we'll also put a link to that on the NAPIT forum for everybody to see as well. Okay, that's great. Thanks for being here, everyone. And um, as I said, any questions, just let me know. I'd just like to say thank you and good night to everybody as well. That's great. Thank you and goodbye.